By my estimation, there's something like 39 quotations relating to the theme of guilt in J.B. Priestley's play, An Inspector Calls. But which 10 do I think you need to know as you study or revise Priestley's play? Let's find out. <music> How's it going Revision Squad? It is me, Liam, aka Mr Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and in this video we are going to think about how the theme of guilt is presented in J.B. Priestley's play An Inspector Calls. Now I did think that I had completed An Inspector Calls a long time ago, but quite a few of you have got in touch to ask about how Priestley presents guilt, and so I thought I should probably make a video. Now I reckon you're going to find it useful to have a pen and some paper out in front of you as you watch my analysis of this theme. That way you will be able to make plenty of notes about various quotations which can only help you as you revise or study Priestley's play. If anything I say or write in this video is helpful please do let me know by dropping this video a like, writing me a comment, sharing the video with anyone who you think might find it useful and of course subscribing to my channel if you aren't already. Alright so I've said that this video is going to be about the theme of guilt but what does that actually mean? Well simply put guilt is feeling bad about doing something wrong like telling a lie, disrespecting your parents or making someone cry. Furthermore, guilt doesn't just have to be caused by doing something actively negative, because you can feel guilt by failing to meet an obligation or by letting someone down. In other words, you can feel guilty by failing to do something positive. Now your exam or teacher might not use the word guilt, and so it might be helpful for me to provide some synonyms or related terms. So, if you're ever asked to write about regret, remorse or shame, the ideas that I cover in this video will be applicable. Okay, now if that's what I mean by the theme of guilt, which quotations might you want to analyse in order to discuss it, and why? So our first quotation occurs right towards the start of Act 1, when Sheila teases Gerald for never coming near her the previous summer he immediately retorts with, And I've told you, I was awfully busy at the works all that time. Now using our knowledge of the play, we know that Gerald isn't exactly telling the truth here. Yes, he was busy at work, but he was also having an affair with Eva Smith. As such, the straightforward way in which he lies to Sheila, by using a declarative sentence and the assertive, almost passive-aggressive phrase, and I've told you, reveals to us as the audience that Gerald has no issue with lying. It isn't something he feels particularly guilty about. Now this quotation is particularly interesting to think about as it shows us how the characters deal with, or don't deal with, guilt prior to the inspector's arrival. This might provide you with a great opportunity to compare how characters' feelings of guilt develop once Ghoul arrives. Does Gerald feel guilty later on in the play? Almost definitely, and it's something I will discuss in just a few minutes. Our second quotation comes courtesy of Mr Burling. Once the inspector has questioned him about his treatment of Eva and how this may have led to her suicide, he replies with, Still, I can't accept any responsibility. If we were all responsible for everything that happened to everybody we'd had anything to do with, it'd be very awkward, wouldn't it? What does this have to do with guilt? Well, I think it shows that Mr. Burling completely rejects any notion of guilt regarding Eva's death. This is immediately made evident by the negative verb construction can't, which is of course the combination of the strong modal verb can and the negative not. What's more though, is that Burling's later comments about responsibility, especially how he describes taking responsibility for what happens to other people using the adjective awkward, suggests that he not only rejects the notion of feeling guilty for Eva's death, but that he rejects notions of guilt 
outright. In other words, Mr. Burling more or less states that he does not ever feel guilt. Remember, you don't just have to analyse dialogue. Stage directions are also incredibly analytically rich. For instance, when the inspector shows Sheila the photograph of Eva, her response is, she looks at it closely, recognises it with a little cry, gives a half stifled sob, and then runs out. Sheila's actions clearly demonstrate a sense of guilt. The little cry and half stifled sob belong to a semantic field of negative emotions, whereas her running out of the room implies that Sheila feels so bad about what she has seen and the conclusions that she draws from this, meaning that she has come to realise that her negative actions have resulted in someone's death, that she cannot handle her feelings of guilt. Indeed, the fact that her sob is altered by the modifier half-stifled shows that as much as she tries to suppress her feelings of guilt, they overwhelm her and take control. In other words, Sheila's feelings of guilt are enormous because they are stronger than her desire to remain composed. Our fourth quotation can be found in Act 2, after the inspector has interrogated Gerald. Once the inspector has confirmed that he has finished with Gerald, the younger man says, In that case, as I'm rather more upset by this business than I probably appear to be, and, well, I'd like to be alone for a while, I'd be glad if you'd let me go. How does this dialogue show guilt? Firstly, Gerald's admission that he is upset implies that he is not only sad because Eva Smith is dead, but possibly also that he is sad because of the part he played in her death. Basically, he's feeling bad because of something bad he did, which is exactly what guilt is. Secondly, his desire to be alone for a while could imply that he is feeling guilty, as it suggests that he wants some time alone to attend to his thoughts, think through his actions regarding Eva, and come to terms with what has happened. Someone who isn't feeling guilty would not see the need to reflect on their actions, because in their mind they have done nothing wrong, and so because Gerald wants to reflect on what he did, his guilt is evident. Lastly, the frequent dashes imply a great deal of emotion on Gerald's part. He is either so cut up by his feelings of guilt that his words are almost being choked out in his throat, or he is feeling so wrapped up in his guilt that he cannot think straight, which is why his dialogue has a bit of a staccato rhythm. Either way, I think it's pretty apparent that Gerald feels incredibly guilty. Next up, we have these two lines of dialogue, which occur during the inspector's questioning of Mrs. Burling. After it is revealed that Mrs. B rejected Eva's plea for help because she used the name Mrs. Burling when appealing to the charity, the inspector asks, You admit being prejudiced against her case? To which Mrs. Burling replies, Yes, I'm very sorry, but I think she only had herself to blame. I've selected these quotations for inclusion in this video for two reasons. Firstly, Mrs. Burling's confirmation that she was prejudiced against Eva Smith's case shows a lack of guilt on the older woman's part because she shows no remorse, despite admitting to doing something incredibly negative, namely being prejudiced against someone. The fact that she so coolly and so simply states, yes, demonstrates that she sees nothing wrong in her actions, and therefore she does not see any reason to feel guilty. Secondly, when Mrs. Burling asserts that Eva only had herself to blame, the straightforward declarative sentence sees Mrs. Burling deflecting all responsibility, therefore shrugging off any possibility of guilt. If Mrs. Burling has nothing to be responsible for, she has nothing to feel guilty about. We're going to stay focused on the inspector's interrogation of Mrs. Burling in order to find our next quotation about guilt. However, this quotation has nothing to do with Mrs. Burling, and instead is about Eva Smith. You see, when the inspector says, So she'd come to you for assistance because she didn't want to take stolen money, 
we get the impression that Eva felt so guilty about the prospect of accepting stolen money, which would have been an easy option for her to take after all, that she chose to seek charitable assistance as an alternative, despite knowing that she would not be guaranteed financial support. The fact that Eva felt so guilty about accepting stolen money implies that she is a character with incredibly high morals. In contrast with the Burlings and Gerald, she appears to feel and accept guilt far more readily, and so perhaps Priestley was trying to suggest that although they may be socially and economically inferior to the middle and upper classes, the working class may in fact be morally superior, and therefore better people. Our next quotation comes right at the end of Act 2. As the penny is starting to drop and Mrs Burling starts to realise that the drunken young man who got Eva pregnant was in fact Eric, she says, agitated, I don't believe it! I won't believe it! Now you have to remember that Mrs Burling has just spent quite a bit of time insisting that it was the young man who got Eva pregnant who should be held responsible for her death and should therefore be the person who is guilty for her tragic passing. The fact that it is someone in her own family who, at her own insistence, is guilty for Eva's death is clearly very difficult for Mrs Burling to accept. Mrs Burling's refusal to believe that the guilt lies somewhere within her own family shows just how deluded she is, as she seems to believe that it is impossible for her or her family to do any wrong. Clearly, this is the delusion of privilege. Furthermore, the stage directions agitated show just how uncomfortable she feels at the prospect of even considering that she or her family could possibly be guilty for anything. If the earlier quotation about Eva suggests how moral the working class are, Mrs Burling's inability to even contemplate guilt shows how immoral the middle and upper classes are capable of being. We don't have to look far for our next quotation, as it is the first line of dialogue in Act 3. Standing there in front of his family and the inspector, Eric asks, You know, don't you? Now this is quite an interesting line of dialogue from a guilt perspective. On the one hand, Eric's question is almost confessional. He is asking his family if they know that he got Eva pregnant, which shows that he is not avoiding the issue anymore. With this interpretation in mind, Eric seems to be confronting his guilt, rather than hiding away from it. He knows he has done something wrong, even just by virtue of getting someone pregnant outside of wedlock, and is trying to address this. On the other hand though, Eric's question is a bit euphemistic. As much as he is trying to address the wrongs he has committed, he does not explicitly state what it is that he has done. For instance, he does not say, you know I got Eva pregnant, don't you? This euphemistic omission could be interpreted as Eric feeling too guilty to directly admit what it is that he has done, or it could be interpreted as him trying to shy away from his guilt somewhat, because if he doesn't say exactly what it is that he has done, that means it doesn't become real. Overall, this means that we have a quotation that is quite complex when it comes to guilt. Eric clearly feels guilty and wants to face up to his guilt, but for some reason he is not able to directly address it just yet. This could suggest that Eric is a character who is not used to accepting blame or facing up to it, but that that is changing, and therefore he is becoming a better person. If Eric was becoming a better person in that last quotation, then in this quotation, he has clearly become that better person. This quotation comes from the part of the play where the inspector has left, Gerald has returned, and the family are generally of the belief that Ghoul was a fraud. Whereas many of the play's central characters are celebrating the fact that Ghoul is allegedly fake, Eric asserts, Whoever that chap was, the fact remains that I did what I did, and Mother did what she did and the rest of you did what you did to her. It is clear that Eric accepts that he is guilty for treating someone poorly, even if that person isn't Eva, 
because he says the fact remains that I did what I did. Because Eric describes his actions using the noun fact, it is clear that he sees them as something unavoidable and undeniable. However, Eric's acceptance of his own guilt is transformed when he states that mother did what she did and the rest of you did what you did. The repetition of the verb did and the frequent use of pronouns, i.e. I, she and you, shows that Eric not only believes that he is guilty of behaving poorly, but that the rest of his family are as well. In the absence of Inspector Ghoul, it appears that Eric has become the play's moral compass, demonstrating now just how readily he accepts guilt and regrets his actions. Our last quotation occurs at the play's conclusion. Specifically, it can be located in the play's closing stage directions. Just as the older Burlings and Gerald believe that all is well and that they will not have to face any consequences for their actions, the telephone rings and Mr Burling is informed that a police inspector is shortly to arrive in order to ask some questions about a young woman's death. The stage directions reveal the character's reactions, which are as follows. He puts the telephone down slowly and looks in a panic-stricken fashion at the others. As they stare guiltily and dumbfounded, the curtain falls. Now, of course, it would be easy for me to just point at the word guiltily and just end the analysis there. But I don't think that would be particularly interesting for me to say or for you to write. Instead, I want to think about the panic-stricken fashion with which Mr. Burling looks at the rest of the characters on the stage. For me, this clearly demonstrates that an immense amount of guilt has finally come crashing down on Mr. Burling. He has now realised, far, far too late, that his actions have consequences, and that the time has come for him and his family to be punished. Guilt has been thrust upon Mr. Burling and his family, and now there is nothing that any of them can do to avoid it. Maybe, just maybe, this is Priestley's way of telling the audience that they really ought to own up to their guilt straight away, rather than delaying and ignoring it. If you want to achieve the top grades in essays about this play, then I think you really ought to consider J.B. Priestley's intentions. Why did Priestley make guilt a theme of his play? What message was he trying to put across? So I think that Priestley made guilt a reoccurring idea in his play so that he could clearly express the idea that people should consider the consequences of their actions. The fact that almost all of the characters ignore or deny their feelings of guilt to some extent throughout the play is what leads them to behave selfishly and unconscientiously, which in turn leads to the pain, awkwardness and discomfort caused by the inspector's questions. By not facing up to their guilt, it seems that the characters are indeed going to face much worse consequences. There may indeed be that scandal that Mr Burling fears, and he may not ever get that knighthood he so desperately craves, as the characters may also face legal punishments for their actions. By presenting such dire consequences to his audience, Priestley may be trying to convince them firstly to not do things that would cause them to feel guilty in the first place, by which I mean he would have wanted to convince them to not behave poorly to other people. And secondly, he would have wanted his audience to embrace their feelings of guilt so that they could then try to correct any wrongs that they have caused. The result of this would be a more kind, conscientious and socially responsible society which of course ties into Priestley's socialist beliefs. Second of all, I think Priestley has used guilt across his play in the way that he has, so that he could demonise individuals who do not show remorse. The characters that come across most negatively in this play, Mr and Mrs Burling and Gerald in my opinion, are also the characters who take the longest to show any sign of remorse, or are the ones who immediately try to find any solution even if that means something as outlandish as the inspector being a fake, that might mean that they are not in fact guilty at all. Again, this would have been because Priestley may have wanted to try to trigger an increased sense of conscientiousness and kindness in society, which of course ties back into his socialist beliefs. 
So that is my discussion of the theme of guilt in An Inspector Calls done. But what could you do next? Well, if you're after some more quotations, you could think about whether or not Eric feels guilty about taking money from the family business. What might his feelings suggest about his views on guilt? You could also think about what the desire to prove that Inspector Gould was a fraud might have to do with how the characters in the play treat guilt. Is it just a chance to deflect and ignore the things that they are guilty of doing? Who is the most keen to try to erase their guilt? And what does that say about them? And on a similar note, what do the different characters' reactions to finding out that school is supposedly fake say about how they treat guilt? Does a sense of relief imply that someone does not feel guilty, or that they are pleased that they are not going to be punished for the things that they are guilty of committing? Now, whether or not you choose to search for those extra quotations, please don't forget to like this video if it has helped you out. Leave a comment on it, either letting me know how useful this video has been, giving me some of your own analysis, or, of course, asking me a question. And obviously, if you aren't already, you could subscribe to my channel as well. But whatever it is that you do choose to do, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are revising, please do remember to take frequent short breaks. As a burned out student, is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. All right, so those are the 10 quotations that I think you need to know if you're thinking about the theme of guilt in J.B. Priestley's play, An Inspector Calls. But which one quotation do you think is the most important for you to know and why? Please do let me know down in the comment section below. Cheers.